So one of the things that Colin talked about that's, that's really quite important is connecting these landscape scale concepts to our urban communities. And we have in this room some of the pioneers of metropolitan green space uh, articulation that have brought to very large metropolitan areas uh, a lot of enthusiasm and insight and energy around building networks that start in the middle of town and extend way, way beyond places like Chicago. In fact, we have here a, a panel who helped to found something called Chicago Wildlands, which is the exemplar for the Metropolitan Green Space Alliance. It was really the first of its kind. And the alliance that they've built, many of them have built, uh, not all of our panelists are from Chicago. <laughs> I want to say Mamie is from right here. Um, extends all the way from southern Wisconsin, through Illinois, around the northern coast of Indiana, all the way to Michigan. And they built a, a consciousness of the edge of this great waterway, this uh, great lake, all the way from Chicago to many, many miles in other directions. How have they done that? What's the next step? That's what we're gonna consider now. Jerry Edelman, who was one of the people who helped to found, to conceive Chicago Wilderness, will introduce this group, Jerry. Thank you, Jim, and, and good morning. Um, you know, yesterday at the beginning of the workshop, Bob Benedict told us that large landscapes have many different meanings, that they can be defined in scientific and geographic terms, but they can also be defined in cultural terms. And uh, when one considers the global evolving demographics that we all are very much aware of, 53% now of the world's population living in metropolitan areas, and well over 80% here in our own country, there are huge implications. And our speakers this morning and many yesterday really emphasized the importance of connecting people to place, to where they live, to their own backyards, to their own communities. Um, and for me, one of um, the thoughts is, you know, that if we're really talking about the future of conservation broadly defined, we have to connect with the youth of these metropolitan areas. They, in the future, will be the decision makers who will shape public policy, you know, who will influence political will. And um, it brought to mind a, a quote from a, an extraordinary fellow, um, Baba Dioud, who was a great Senegalese leader and conservationist, and some of you may be familiar with this, but I always find it inspirational. He says, in the end, we will conserve only what we love, we will love only what we understand, and we will understand only what we have been taught. Now, my own organization, Open Lands, was formed at the dawn of the modern environmental movement 51 years ago, 1963. And we were formed by the Welfare Council of Greater Chicago. So people have always been kind of at the core of our work, connecting people to the land. We feel that nature is vital to all people and that you have to work at many different scales. And so our geography is more or less the Chicago wilderness geography. In our case, the southern shore of Lake Michigan with the three states, Wisconsin, Illinois, and Indiana. And as we started to uh, work on particular projects, Frequently, there weren't good models out there because there wasn't a lot of work being done early on in these metro areas. So almost by definition, you know, we had to come up with new methodologies with kind of creative approaches. And so, for example, some of the, the early projects, we joined forces with many others, uh, and those efforts led to the creation of the Indiana Dunes National Lakeshore this mosaic of extraordinarily rich biodiversity, globally threatened ecosystems, uh, in and among industry. Everything we do is done in partnerships. That's been one of the other great themes here this morning and throughout all of yesterday, and I'm sure it'll continue today, both public and private. Um, one of the other kind of innovative uh, programs was 
the Prairie Path, which was the first example of an abandoned railroad being converted into a hiking and biking trail with extraordinary prairie remnants along it. Now, of course, a national movement. Um, in just 30 years ago, actually this year, the creation of the first national heritage area, in this case, along the route of the historic Illinois and Michigan Canal that connected Chicago and Lake Michigan with the Illinois River 100 miles below. Today, as you know, there are 49 of these around the country. Um, in the early 90s, uh, the Joliet Arsenal, huge property, uh, was closed, and uh, Open Lands led efforts with many wonderful partners to create Medewin, the first national tall grass prairie, over 20,000 acres. And most recently, again with all sorts of partners, worked to establish our first national wildlife refuge in the, Mil in the Milwaukee, Chicago region called Hackmatack that bridges our two states, Wisconsin and Illinois. But, um, you know, from community gardens to urban forests to green, green schoolyards to trails, blueways, greenways, I mean, large protected natural areas, this web of green within our Chicago wilderness, wilderness region creates this interconnected large landscape of both people and place, and we call that home. And today we've got an extraordinary panel here who really represent among the best practitioners of large landscape uh, conservation work in metropolitan areas, and it's my great pleasure to briefly introduce them. Our moderator, John Rogner, a great friend and colleague who, um, as you heard, was uh, one of the key organizers of this workshop's program. John is uh, the coordinator for the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service of the Upper Midwest and Great Lakes Landscape Conservation Cooperative. Um, before that, he actually took a leave from the Forest Service and uh, was the assistant director of the Illinois Department of Natural Resources and, and shaped many important initiatives there and previously was the field supervisor of the Chicago office of U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. But most importantly for me, uh, John was also chair of Chicago Wilderness and provided fabulous uh, dedication and leadership there in this extraordinary coalition of not-for-profits, government agencies, and uh, educational institutions, research institutions. We're also joined by Mamie Parker, whom I just met, but an amazing person. Right now, she's president of M.A. Parker & Associates, located in Washington here. But for almost 30 years, Mamie worked as a professional biologist and was a senior executive with the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service. She served with great distinction as the regional director of the 13-state northeastern region, and she's received all sorts of prestigious awards. But she's passionate about engaging diverse populations is traveling all over the country with this important message. And interestingly, she does serve on the board of the Chesapeake Conservancy. Another great friend and colleague of mine, we're kind of heavy here in Chicago, but that's okay. <laughs> I think uh, we, uh, we have people here who have a breadth of experience beyond their uh, work on the ground in Chicago. But the next is Arnold Randall. And Arnold is the general superintendent of the forest preserves of Cook County. Now this is, uh, the nation's oldest and actually largest forest preserve system. They're celebrating right now their 100th anniversary, their centennial. And uh, Arnold has worked both in the public and private sectors, including key positions with the University of Chicago, the City of Chicago, the Chicago Park District. And um, he was a key player in Chicago's bid to try to secure the 2016 Olympics, among many other things. But he has many civic commitments and engagements and right now is the present chair of Chicago Wilderness. And last but certainly not least is a person I've also just met very briefly, and that's Bruce Roll. And Bruce very graciously has agreed to step in for Mike Wetter, who unfortunately became ill and isn't able to be with, with us today. But Bruce is the director of Watershed Management for Clean Water Services, and, the, and it's not-for-profit Clean Water Institute, which is based in Hillsborough, Oregon. Since uh, 2007, Bruce has managed the nation's largest full-scale water quality trading program that targets riparian and um, flow restoration. He's also a founding member of the uh, Intertwine Alliance, and he serves on its board of directors, and again, has worked both in public and private sector and brings a breadth of experience and insight. So um, my great pleasure to introduce this panel and to turn it over to our moderator, John Rogner. Thank you.
Yeah. Thank you, Jerry. Thank you, everybody, for, for uh, joining us this morning. I can see we're getting off to a bad start already. <laughs> My apologies to Bruce. Um, you can't see that, but Mike Wetter is up there. Uh, so <laughs> forgot to change this one. So in your mind's eye, replace Mike Wetter with Bruce Roll. The rest of that part is okay, the Intertwine Alliance. And thanks for stepping in today. Uh, I want to set the stage for the, these uh, three uh, panelists, three speakers who will share their thoughts. I'm going to, I'm going to start with a, a very insightful observation made by my friend and colleague, Sir Peter Crane, Dean of the School of Forestry at Yale University. In an editorial published in the journal Science in 2005, he said this. He said, we're witnessing a key moment in the history of our species. For the first time, more people live in cities than outside them. Now and into the future, we will be Homo urbanus, the urban dweller. And of course, as Jerry mentioned, uh, that's a, a global statistic, that 50% in the US and other industrial countries that approaches 85%. And addressing uh, this change in our planet is a very important consideration in landscape scale conservation. Metropolitan areas are large landscapes. We have to think about them as conservation landscapes because they're also resource rich landscapes. In the past, we in the natural resource profession didn't view them as such. We saw them mostly in terms of their environmental hazards. We saw them primarily as threats. We didn't actively engage in conservation planning in urban areas, but we need to rethink this approach. Uh, not just be because cities are resource rich, but just because of the sheer area of land they occupy. Now look at the change by decade. This is density of housing units, and when you start getting into the red colors, that's a lot of dwellings, which means a lot of people. So here's 1940, 1950. Pick the metro area of your choice and follow it through. 1960, 1970, 1980, 1990, 2000. Here we're up to the present. Let's project it out a little bit. The reds get redder. The oranges turn to reds. And you can see it's a massive landscape that's urbanized. We can't afford not to plan within these areas. We have to think of them less as threats and more as opportunities with proper urban design because the threats are in many ways design problems. We can design them with habitat hubs and linkages. We can design them to incorporate natural area remnants and restore buffers. For a century, the Forest Preserve District of Cook County has been doing this, assembling these habitat hubs and linkages, and Arnold Randall will say a word about that. Uh, cities are where people are, obviously, where political and intellectual capital is concentrated, where public opinion is shaped, and where some of the largest economic engines for conservation can be found. They can be powerful forces for conservation, but they have to be organized for conservation for maximum effect. Uh, there are a lot of emerging coalitions. The intertwine is one, and Bruce will say a few words about that. <clears throat> Finally, our single greatest imperative, in my view, is getting people connected to the natural world so that we foster this culture of conservation in our residents, however that expresses ourselves. You know, I'm thinking about um, Deputy Ag Secretary Krista Hardin's comments yesterday. We, she, she talked about her roots, her grounding on the farm she was raised in a dirt road, uh, end of a dirt road in Georgia. I think she called it Nowheresville, Georgia. <laughs> she still goes there to get respite and get recharged, but she brings that foundation of experience to her job making decisions on behalf of a huge agency with a huge budget that affects millions of acres of land. She draws on that foundation all the time. The next uh, Krista Hardin may more likely come from suburban Atlanta uh, or Detroit or Dallas. Will outdoor experiences be among the new Krista Hardin only if we actively help create and cultivate those opportunities. They don't always happen as an automatic byproduct of childhood anymore. There are a lot of ways to do this, and Mamie Parker and likely our other uh, panelists will have a, say to word, uh, have, have a word or two to say about that. A lot of this is going to come down to protecting or building nature into the places where we live if we hope to develop the citizenry that broadly shares the values of the natural world. I think in nature-filled cities, may be the preservation of the wild. So I'm going to ask uh, Arnold Randall to join us and share a few thoughts of his, and we'll ask the other panelists to do the same.
you go. Thank you. Good morning. Good morning. Thanks, John. Uh, and it's a thrill to be here. So uh, again, my name is Arnold Randall. I'm the General Superintendent of the Forest Preserves of Cook County. And if you don't know where that is, just think about Chicago and then think about an area much larger than Chicago around it. That's our picture up there. We're in the northeastern corner of uh, the state of Illinois, right on Lake Michigan. Uh, so when you think about Chicago, you are probably not thinking about nature. You're probably thinking about the skyscrapers and all the sports and our, you know, the uh, museums and all the, the interesting culture that happens there and blues and jazz and all kinds of things and President Obama's hometown, all that stuff, uh, that's Chicago. But it's also uh, the home to 69,000 acres of open space uh, owned and, and managed by the Forest Preserve System of Cook County and also a, a wonderful park system. I'm not here to talk about that, but certainly a park system that has another 8,500 acres of, of open space in the city itself. Um, that's about 11% of the county footprint <clears throat> dedicated to open space in the Forest Preserve System. And as uh, Jerry mentioned, we're celebrating Centennial. We're right in the midst of that. And um, we were fortunate enough to have people, really visionary people, you know, 100 years ago, really sort of recognize that urban life was tough and that you really needed to protect this space uh, for, for folks living there and for obviously for all the habitat and the wildlife that, that exists there. And we're talking about an area that's about 5 million people. Uh, this is the second largest county in the, county in the country, right after Los Angeles County in, uh, in California. Um, we're also home to 112 threatened or endangered species in the forest preserve system. So if we don't exist, they don't exist. Um, millions of people visit us each year. They use our trail system. We've got 300 miles of trail uh, that, we, that we count. There's a whole bunch of other trail out there that people sort of forage through and create themselves. But certainly, there's a lot of trail out there, paddle, fish. Uh, hike, all sorts of things that happen in the forest preserve system. We have our own botanic garden, which is Chicago Botanic Garden, a world-class institution and a zoo as well. Uh, and so we really make, you know, we feel like we're the, the main opportunity for people in urban areas, at least our urban area, to get connected to, to uh, wildlife and to nature. Um, so we've been on board, I've been on board almost four years now. As there was a change in administrations about four years ago. We have a wonderful leader in Tony Preckwinkle, who's our board president. Um, but we recognized that our centennial was coming. We wanted to do something to sort of uh, leverage that into a better place and a, and a better way of managing. So one of the things that came out of that with the help of our partners, Jerry and Open Lands and uh, Metropolis Strategies, which was an organization in Chicago, helped us put together our next century conservation plan. And really being visionary, you know, we're the home of Daniel Burnham. Uh, so really just sort of thinking about how do you think big uh, and, and what do we want to be for the next hundred years? So four major goals came out of that, and it really had to do with people, uh, the, number one, the land, uh, people, uh, making sure that people understood the value of the land, uh, both from an economic standpoint and otherwise, uh, and then making sure that the leadership supported that in the long term. We've had problems, all governments have problems over time with, man, with sort of how they operate and how they function and how they support their mission. Um, we had some ambitious targets in there, so we want to restore, of these 69,000 acres, we want to restore 30,000 to an, a good ecological health, and that's, you know, land, very aggressive land management practices. Uh, we want to expand our preserve system from 69,000 to 90,000. Uh, we want to engage people of all different communities, and obviously Chicago is a very diverse city, uh, like, like most big cities. Uh, we want to make sure that those folks are, they're actively engaged in the forest preserves, because again, if the decision makers are being born, and I, I would say they're already been born and making decisions now. I'm a city guy uh, myself, and so we're all in these positions, and more, more people are living and coming out of cities, and if they don't have those experiences, they're going to make bad decisions about nature and in the environment, so it's really important. Uh, and then also we're creating an advisory council of folks who will help keep us on track, um, make sure that we're staying true to our mission. Uh, pre preserving nature today in, a, in an urban environment is difficult. Uh, politics are always there. As I'm not, every, a lot of folks here deal with federal government, it sounds like, but in uh, local government, they've got the same kinds of issues, just uh, more pronounced in some ways, I'd say. Um, one of the things that we worked on also is a natural and cultural areas master plan. Uh, we, we didn't have a good sense of organizationally how to manage some of these resources, and frankly, our cultural resources. Uh, so, you know, Illinois, like a lot of places in the Midwest, is home to many, many Native American uh, uh, sites and, and, and tribes that still exist, and we have not managed those, those Native American artifacts and, and those cultural, that cultural history very well. So that's part of what we're doing through a, a, large, a much larger plan in which we're completing right now to how we manage those properties. 
Um, so over the next 25 years, to restore those 30,000 acres, that's going to take 135,000 people working on that. So, and that's really volunteers, that's people that will be paid, that'll be a, lot, a combination of a lot of different things. We've already got a start on that. We've got 6,000, we're partnering with some local groups. We're always partnering with groups like Open Lands and Friends of the Forest Preserves and Friends of the Chicago River and, and others to make these things happen. We can't do it on our own dime. So I would stress partnerships are important to get these kinds of things done in any environment, but certainly in our environment uh, in Chicago. Um, we're going to create a conservation corps uh, and sort of modeled after what happened in the 1930s in, in the larger country. And uh, we're working with the Chicago Jobs Council to put that together and how it will, how it will function uh, and how so it's a very realistic thing. And we're partnering with organizations like Green Corps Chicago, which takes uh, people who've had challenges or barriers to employment or have had even some checkered past and gets them in back in the workforce and teaches them how to do restoration work and conservation work. Uh, in our environment, but we're also working with folks who, who don't have checkered pass, people who, young people who want to get involved and we want to get them engaged in what we do. So our goal is to do these things on a much larger scale. Um, I'll skip through that one. I just say this, is, you know, just briefly just want to say that, you know, what we're doing in Chicago is, is something that can and is being replicated in a lot of other places and we're very fortunate that we had great leadership and visionary leadership by people like Jerry and John and a lot of other folks back in the mid-90s and recognizing that we have to do more in urban areas and so we're very fortunate uh, to be part of that and uh, really excited to talk about it today. Thank you. Bruce Roll, please join us. <laughs> it's Mike Wetter. <laughs> Mike Wetter, much more good looking than I am. <laughs> he doesn't know this is there. This is going into the internet and saying pictures of Mike Wetter, finding it, and then pasting an intertwined logo on top of it. <laughs> I thought about, you know, his, his issue in Belgium is he's having trouble <coughs> eyes. I thought about putting a, you know, a pirate's patch across it. But, uh, well, we better wait till he comes home safe and sound. But he wishes all of you uh, the best. Uh, before I get started, though, I'd like to ask a question. I'm a public utility guy. How many other public utility people do we have in here? Stand up. Stand up. Why didn't you guys bring a public utility person with you? Ponder that as we talk. Um, I want you to envision, envision uh, walking 20 miles in a day, and going home, sleeping, getting back up, walking another 20 miles. Get home, three days, walk another 20 miles. Well, by the end of day three, you know you aren't going to make it a fourth, because 60 <laughs> miles in three days is a long way. You might get half that distance the next day. That's the distance that's been restored in the Tualatin and the greater Portland area in less than a decade with native plants and vegetation. Imagine a child planting a tree in a public park. Now imagine one million of them going in in a single year. That's what's happening in the greater Portland area. Why? It's because of partnerships like the Intertwine. Eight years ago, six of us got together, utility guy, uh, some people from Audubon, some parks and open space people, Mike Wetter uh, and others. And we said, you know, there isn't enough money. We're not acting on a scale that's meaningful, that will truly have an impact on the environment. And we're constrained by multiple regulatory silos that waste our money in many cases and don't collectively leverage all the ecological possibilities that are there. So a tall order, and as we began to think about my needs as a utility, the needs of the parks of the open space people, great opportunities opened up. Opportunities for restoring thousands upon thousands of acres. For me as a utility, I'm trying to offset the investment in hard infrastructure, cement, concrete, with a marriage between my regulatory needs and the needs of the environment. It's paid off in the grandest sense in the, 
in this area. So as these characters evolved over the, 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 the years, uh, we began to take on other partners, both public and private. And before long, you began to see a snowball. A snowball when I was able to place large-scale projects on the ground using existing cash with existing partners. All of a sudden, people thought, wow, I want a piece of that. And they start the pile on. Today, the intertwines over 120 organizations are partners in it. It's public, private, and uh, governmental people like me. It's been phenomenal what's happened over the, the, the last decade. I'm so excited about looking forward to it. And, and as we move forward, you know, I think the real challenge, and we see it here, the federal government is under the same constraints we are locally of having no more, but using the same amount, but using it differently. And our challenges of opening up those regulatory silos so that the Clean Water Act, the Safe Drinking Water Act, ESA, land use management all talk and integrate together in a way that makes sense. So I'm, I'm pleased that, you know, in Oregon we've, we've made that jump and I, I look forward to, you know, working with all these great partners and, and, and seeing the same activity throughout the United States in the coming years. Thank you. So Mamie Parker, how do we connect a landless urban population to the land? I know you have the answers because you're all about connections. Please share your thoughts with us. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Wait a minute, I'm an African-American Creole Cajun that happens to be the granddaughter of a minister and in my culture, if you want me to feel welcome when I call, I ask you to respond. Amen. Good morning. Good morning. Thank you very much. I think I'll stay a while. I am excited about this opportunity. In fact, as I looked out on the audience and thought about this panel, I had to think about the woman in my life that really, really helped me understand and appreciate conservation. And I get emotional every time I think about her. It was my mother, the avid angler, and she was a sharecropper and a maid in southern Arkansas. And it was about this time of the year, my birthday was Tuesday, last Tuesday. She had already had five boys and five girls. And she was about to have her 11th child. And she said, these kids are really working the fields and they're really, really doing a good job there, but they don't have an appreciation for the outdoors. And she said, my last child, that boy, I'm going to take him outside and show him how to appreciate nature. She was also impressed with President Eisenhower at the time because he had sent troops into Little Rock High School to escort them into that segregated school. And so she said, I'm gonna name my boy Ike. <laughs> it was on the president's birthday that I was born and I'm so glad she didn't name me Ike. <laughs> <laughs> my mother did name me Mamie and she said that was the first lady of the country at the time. And she said, I'm hoping one day that my baby will be the first lady to do something. Well, it's often that I've had a chance in conservation to be that first lady to do something. Today in particular, the first one not to be from Chicago. I have a lot of connections <laughs> with Chicago. However, I am very honored to be on this panel. I'm very honored to be a part of the family that will talk about what's important to us. What Mama often do did every morning, she would line all of us up before we went to school and she'd look at us and she'd say, you're a piece of work. You're a piece of work. You're a family, you're a network, you're a legacy. And then when she said that, she really wanted us to go out and represent that very well. I want you now to look at your neighbor and say, you're a piece of work. <laughs> Tell your neighbor, look at your neighbor, you're a piece of work. Piece of work. <laughs> now often, often when my mother did that, 
She said it in different ways to different kids. <laughs> the twins, she often said to them, you're a piece of work because they talked a lot. She often looked at me and said, you're a piece of work because she knew that I'd get in trouble in school. <laughs> but I tell you, when I think about urban lands and how they fit into this landscape conservation, they are a piece of work. And I'm here this morning to say it's great to hear and see how you, Jim, Joel, and others, Doug, have really elevated this issue and allowed us to talk about it in a plenary session. You realize that this piece of work, for decades, we haven't always dealt with it. For decades, we've been stalled, stuck, and scared to move wholeheartedly and place emphasis on urban lands. For decades, we have been stuck on numbers of large numbers of acres, miles, and large number of species. And because of that, we oftentimes ignored those forgotten lands. For many years, we've been stuck, stalled, and scared because we knew that we didn't have the finances and the funds to really, really to be able to purchase some of these lands. We weren't sure if we could restore them, and we weren't sure we were ready because we were scared of the non-traditional conservation partners that we had to really work hard to get to. We let fear, false evidence appearing real, F-E-A-R, fear, kept us from reaching out and solving that problem. But it was those whispers that brought this to our attention. Then that problem got louder, and we saw petal, pebbles brushing against us. Later, the bricks came, and the problem and the crisis that we couldn't ignore. So we started paying more attention to those forgotten lands. Then, in many cases, the disaster came with storms and floods. And we realized that we must we must address those lands and include them. Maya Angelou, a fellow Arkansan, said, when we know better, we do better. We're doing great things now when it comes to those forgotten lands, looking at them, figuring out a ways to put them in the right place. And I'm excited about my panelists and what they've said already and what they'll say this afternoon about the subject. We know that these lands are a piece of work. We've put the emphasis there. All over the country, we see great movements in that area. I look out in the audience at my friend Elsa Hubbard and the staff at the Fish and Wildlife Service digging deeper to find the support and the interest out there to do it. I think about and celebrate my friends Jim Kurth and Cynthia Martinez over at the National Fish and the National Wildlife Refuge System as they focus on urban wildlife partnerships focusing on things like the Baltimore Wilderness Partnership, which I happen to have the privilege and pleasure to work with through the Chesapeake Conservancy. They pushed me out the door and said, this is something we want to learn more about. And they also admitted to the fact that we could learn from the Chicago Wilderness. And I'm of the opinion, if the shoe fits, buy it in every color. <laughs> That's what we're going to do in the Baltimore wilderness area as we go out and Genevieve LaRouche and others are talking about the Baltimore wilderness area. They're focusing on resilience, biodiversity, equity, and discovery in that area. Looking for creative ways, innovative ways, and lasting conservation tools and strategies. We have others that are on our way. My sister in conservation, Cindy Donors, telling me about one down in Jackson, Mississippi that they're talking about. We are inspired by what Chuck Hunt and Jonathan Dougherty and others, Joe McCauley and others are doing right in the Chesapeake Conservation Partnership. Conservationists all over are being able to overcome being stuck, stalled, and scared. That's because we realize that people are important in this process. 
And as I close, I want to talk more about the people part of this whole process. We realize that they're there. Sometimes we just need help on figuring out how to reach out to them, to those partners that will make a difference. And even in IAFWA, they have that blue ribbon panel that's going to reach out to corporate America to get them to help us with tools, maps, and strategy, and data, and all the good things that we need to make a difference in the conservation world as we look at urban areas. But I think about it over the 30 years working in conservation, whether I worked in Minnesota or Wisconsin with the farmers in Missouri, the Boot Hill of Missouri, or the Mississippi River Valley, even with the timber companies and corporations serving as the regional director in the Northeast, what I notice is all of our partners, they all want one thing. They want to feel respected. They want to know that they are a valid member of the team. They want to believe in the partners in the process. And they pride themselves to contribute something that is really, really meaningful and successful. In the 1990s, I had a chance to write a lot of the budget documents and go down to Chicago as they were developing the Chicago wilderness area. I had a chance to meet Alex MacArthur as we were working through this. And I remember his words when he said, keep your agreements. And this came to mind as I was writing this presentation and I thought about the four agreements that Mia Rez talks about. Be impeccable with our words. That's what our partners want. Always do our best. Don't make assumptions. Don't go in there thinking that we know the right thing to do. We need to ask our partners that. Needs assessments. And don't take it personal. Don't take it personal. Because my cousin Pookie and Junebug, sometimes they might show up. Sometimes they won't, but when they do, they'll be there because they care too about a healthy environment for themselves and where they live. They wonder about asthma in their community and where it's coming from and what happened to the air there. They wonder about the water that their grandparents went out and got smelt in the Lake Michigan area. In all of these partnerships, we have to realize that every flower must grow through dirt. And we got to forget about those problems we've had in the past and focus on comprehensive relationships, environmental education, and community engagements. We have to think about the end in mind, enjoyment, deployment, and employment, youth and more green jobs in the area. And finally, what my friend Joel always says, we have to believe in magic. And that's what we want to see in urban areas. They are a piece of the work. Thank you. <laughs> OK, so in the tradition that Mamie invoked, uh, I want to say, and I want all of you to join me in saying amen. <laughs> <laughs> that was great, Mamie. Um, we have time for a couple of questions, and then we're going to move on to the concurrent sessions. So comments or questions on urban conservation and how that fits into our larger agenda. We have one right here. OK. Yes, please. Testing. All right, a uh, question in, uh, I think probably any of you might be uh, able to, to answer this, but there's a, a little book that's just been uh, published in the U.S., Island Press, called uh, Urban Acupuncture. I suspect a lot of you know about that little book, uh, Jamie Lerner. <clears throat> and um, the reason I bring it up is you know, I, I've you know I've I've been well aware of uh, Chicago wilderness for quite some time. Uh, I work for the Fish and Wildlife Service, and it's a great great example of of green infrastructure. Um, and I'm just wondering, uh, in 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 light of the, the the this urban acupuncture idea of just small pinpricks of of really 
human uh, conservation in urban areas. Does, is Chicago Wilderness taking that approach as well as the idea of larger chunks of land, uh, you know, refuge, refuges, et cetera? Is, is there an element of urban acupuncture in the Chicago Wilderness approach? Yeah, I think, um, thank you for the question. So I think you know, we're certainly reaching out to people where they are. I've heard that said a few times since I've been here. Um, you know, and there's, you know, how do you get people to do conservation where they live in their own yards? Um, we go, you know, as a forest preserve, uh, we go into the city where there are no forest preserves and we, we, we work with people in the city to get them connected, to want, get them to want to come out to a forest preserve and spend time out in nature. There's a lot of programming that's part of that as well. So I think uh, the reality is that a lot of people, not just in cities, but all over have a lot of different priorities which we compete with and they don't necessarily understand why being in nature or certainly conserving nature is a big priority for them. And so we see part of our responsibility as Chicago Wilderness is to help educate people. Uh, and some of us just getting them connected first and then you can get with the deeper conservation message afterwards. But I think it's important people understand that there's value to them in being out in nature. It's not something to be scared of. And I think, you know, others would say, and, and I would too, there are a lot of, there's a lot of baggage that comes with nature for different constituencies, different groups. And so part of it is really talking, Mamie said really talking to people don't come in with preconceived notions, but people have different issues. And a lot of it's lack of knowledge or some of it's just really bad history that we all have to sort of get into and deal with so that people will feel comfortable with nature and see it as part of just everyday life, which is not necessarily the case today. And maybe just a quick footnote here that Chicago Wilderness is a broad coalition. It has members, and many members, like my organization, for years have been working in, with partners in inner city communities, developing community gardens, green school campuses, urban forestry work, monarch butter reclamation efforts, et cetera, et cetera. So you have to look to the collective work of Chicago Wilderness through its individual members to really get a, a full picture. Okay, one more. I, I think I see one more person lined up to ask a question behind you. Ma'am? No? Nope. Down here. Okay. Right here. Okay, last question. Well, I, I think about my mother again when she says, all, what, when all is said and done, sometimes more is said than done. <laughs> so I, I really don't think a whole lot of training is what's necessary. It's uh, some awareness and sensitivity, and it's in some cases, just get out there and be okay uh, being in that environment and, and feeling uh, that you're going to trust yourselves to do the best that you can do. Uh, sensitivity training might be necessary, but I think that in general, I wouldn't worry a whole lot about the actual training itself. I would talk to the people in the community to find out what they think, the opinion leaders in the community to get their ideas of what uh, works in their particular area, and then maybe they could give some recommendations on what uh, training would be necessary. But again, I don't think we ought to spend a whole lot of time on that. We need to be focused on uh, doing, but in the event that the community says that it's necessary and they're concerned about that, then I think sensitivity, awareness, uh, that type of training would be great. Yeah. I would just say, uh, to add on to that, recruit people from those communities. That's, that's part of what we've been doing. We have a program called Wild Indigo. Uh, we've recruited people from those communities who have an interest, and then we've helped to train them. They, we, know, we put them in our master naturalist programs, and, uh, and they've been phenomenal in connecting with people from those communities and breaking down some of the barriers and fears and lack of information. So recruit people from those communities, have an open mind, try to have diversity in the people who make decisions around you. I think it's important so you can, under, you can better understand what people's issues are. I have a very diverse staff that works with me in my job, intentionally so, because I, I don't 
pretend to know everybody's different perspectives. And so I think it's really important as much as possible to have, or if, if you can't hire them, then make sure you have a, a sort of advisory group that helps to advise you on all these different issues of you know, diversity and how you deal with different cultures and different groups. Okay. With that, I want to invite you all to move on to your concurrent sessions. Lunch will be at noon in the Atrium Hall where we met yesterday. Thank you very much to this panel for a great...